and I do spend extra time talking about in, in the offerings talking like this because I want you to guys to be giving deliberately, not just out of habit or out of religious tradition or just be, you know, I want you to de deliberately give with a purpose. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to talk about now, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, haven't we? The mighty Spirit of God. And we've, we've gone through quite a lesson on that. Now what we're going to do is we're now we're going to move into <clears throat> spiritual gifts. We're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit of God. And we're going to go down and we're going to see what the importance of spiritual gifts are. We're also going to go into each gift and explain how it operates, what's God's purpose for it. So you don't want to miss a one. Amen? Because we want to operate in spiritual gifts in this church, don't we? Some of you have spiritual gifts and you don't even know it. You might even be operating them and don't even identify them as a spiritual gift from God. It's the truth. So as we go through this, we're going to discover that you actually have gifts that you're walking in. You don't even realize they're from God or by the Spirit of God. And when you do realize it is, then you can deliberately operate in that gift and begin to be quite powerful for the kingdom of God. Amen? So, let's, but let's talk about gifts in general, okay? Barnum Research, okay? They, they went out and they did surveys and everything, and they asked, what do you think the gifts of the Spirit are? What are these gifts of the Spirit? <laughs> Just talking to people randomly, he says, one said the gifts of the Spirit is listening. Some said the gifts of the Spirit is patience. Some said it's a, the gifts of the Spirit is a personality. There's a lot of confusion out there, isn't there? One said it means friendliness. The gifts of the Spirit is friendliness. The gifts of the Spirit is poetry. It's just odd to different people what, what they think the gifts of the Spirit is. Uh, going to church is simply a gift of the Spirit. For some of you, it is a gift. <laughs> it's what got me here, you know. Uh, or being likable. Or survival. The gifts of the Spirit is to survive on. <laughs> or it's just an observation. I don't know how they came up with this stuff. Or being a good person. Having the gifts of the Spirit is... Being a good person. People are ignorant of spiritual gifts. And why is that? Because it's not taught in churches. People are clueless. They don't know what the gifts of the Spirit. In church, they're not teaching the gifts of the Spirit. And so you get all these kind of answers like this. Or they're willingly not wanting to go there as individuals. They're afraid of the gifts. And again, that's usually because they haven't been taught. Nothing to be afraid of about the gifts of the Spirit. In fact, in the early church, it was quite natural to operate in spiritual gifts. They didn't have the hang-ups that we have today because we're just not taught. Now, I know me coming from a Pentecostal background. You know, uh, when I was in La Junta, uh, we saw all kinds of crazy stuff. People crawling around on the floor, hooting and hollering, barking like a dog, you know. And, and doing this and saying that this is, this is the Spirit of God moving, you know. And it's no wonder it chase people off. It's no wonder there's churches that don't want to have anything to do with the Holy Spirit and the, and the gifts of the Spirit. Because there's all kinds of wacky things that will come out of that because people get in their flesh. They get in their flesh. And if you haven't been taught about spiritual gifts, then you're going to, because you have a flesh that you can get into. But the Word instructs us on how to operate in properly and decently and in order in the gifts and how not to and warns us against doing it. And in the first, in first Corinthians, that whole book was about them having problems with telling what was of the Spirit of God and what was their pagan beliefs, and they were confused with them. And so with Paul instructing the Corinthian church on weeding out what was pagan in their lives and what was God in their life, allows us then to have some insight because we have a tendency to take our worldly thinking and apply it to spiritual things. 
So if we can take the counsel and the teaching that Paul gave us, then we could also walk in the gifts of the Spirit and not be afraid of them, but do them successfully. Amen? You have the mighty Spirit of God on the inside of you that wants to move through you and does it by the gifts. So we need to get educated, don't we, on what the gifts of the Spirit are. We spend more time on, are they for us today, or are they real, or are they, are they the God, or are they of the devil? I can remember in La Junta when I first got born again, um, I was only a few months old, and, and uh, I got to La Junta, and I hooked into this Pentecostal group, and they were the only ones in La Junta that, were, that even acknowledged like the Holy Spirit and, and gifts and all this kind of stuff. And so I was at their Christian coffee house having a meeting there, and um, man, they, they started worshiping in tongues, and man, I mean, they were laying hands on each other, and I might go, what is this? You know, I've never seen anything like this before. And finally, I just said, do, you, do I need to have this Holy Spirit, you know, this baptism of the Holy Spirit? And they go, yeah, you need to have that. They didn't push it on me. I said, well, I'll, I'll receive what, what, you know. So they laid hands on me, and boom, man, I was, kula sakili alali mutaki. I mean, there was no, nobody had to talk me into speaking in tongues, man. It just happened. But I didn't have anything to unlearn either. A lot of us struggle with that. We're afraid of it because I didn't know till months later when I went out to work. I was, I was stationed in the Air Force, and I was out on, the, on a detachment out there that some of the other denominational people that were out there, when they found out I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I was, I was excited about it. I was telling everybody about it. Wow, this is awesome. And they were telling me, well, no, 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 don't be going around saying that stuff. That's of the devil. I didn't know until months later, man, I did something of the devil. But you know what? That experience was so awesome. It's like, you're too late to tell me that. I know that it's God. You're too late. And I'm here to tell you that people will, will you know, there's, there's a big think out there that where the Holy Spirit's not for us today. And these gifts are not for us today. You know, uh, when the, all the apostles died, then we didn't need the gifts and any of that kind of stuff because now we have the written word. Really? They had a written word. They had the Old Testament, didn't they? And they refer to it constantly in the New Testament. So they had the word. But look, if they needed to be led around by the Spirit of God and they needed spiritual gifts in order to be a witness for Christ and be able to function in this earth as a representative of the kingdom, then what makes you think you don't? You need to be a proper representative of the kingdom, and those that are representing the kingdom are operating in the spirit, being led by the spirit, and operating the spiritual gifts. Amen. Now, we're going to get way more in-depth into this. This is, this is like surface stuff. We're, getting, we're just getting, uh, uh, getting our toes wet. So just breaking through these tough uh, uh, questions is, is hard enough to wrestle with. It's hard to find commentaries on the subjects from spirit-filled people. I know that, that, you know, in the time that I'm studying and stuff like this, it's hard to find people out there who wrote, who's written commentaries on, on the Bible and that, that are spirit-filled. I mean, you, you'll be clicking along with a person with a commentary and you'd get to a part that talks about the Holy Spirit and it's almost like they skip over the top of it because they don't know what to do with it. Or they'll explain it, try to explain it away the best they can and then, and then get back to, you know, it's, it's like they're, it makes them uncomfortable. You can sense it in their writings. They're uncomfortable with the subject. Why don't you just embrace it? Just embrace him. Amen. So there's a few out there. Bob Yandian is awesome. Great commentary, spirit-filled. Um, uh, Rick out at the Bible College. Yeah. I mean, he, he's written lots of commentaries. Go to his website. And uh, you can download them for free. He gives them away. And, and I've referred to his material many times. I mean, it's, it's good stuff, good, reliable material. But it's hard to find people, commentaries. You know, Andrew Womack and, and others, I've got his living commentary in that. Um, but they're few and far between. It's hard to find it. Because the church, for some reason, wants to sidestep the Holy Spirit. Well, we know why. Because that's the power therein. 
That's the power of the church. And the, and the devil has almost successfully, completely successfully defanged the church from its power. We need to get back. These are the end of the end times. There's a great revival rising up right now. You may not see it in the United States, but you go to third world countries and go around the world, man, people are coming to Jesus by the thousands. And as this country collapses and has less and less unity, there, there's going to be many coming to Christ too. And we got to be ready. Amen? We got to stop playing religion and start playing kingdom of God. We got to start representing the king. You are a prince in the kingdom of God. We need to start walking and acting like it. Because you're in Christ Jesus. Amen. All right. So, the gifts of supernatural power can be abused. And we're going, to, we're going to be talking about abuses of the gifts of the Spirit. It's a gift. If the gift is welcomed, it is usually prophecy. That's usually the most welcomed gift in the church. If they recognize any kind of gift of the Spirit at all, they seem to like the prophecy. They like to get a word from God. That usually is the most. But I'll tell you what, it's the most abused, too. It's the most abused. And... What we're going to get into, how, how to prophesy properly, what's the purpose of prophecy, how to receive prophecy from an individual or, or from a corporate, how to receive it, how to discern whether or not it's God or not God. How many of you would like to have this kind of information? This is, this is important stuff. And see, if you're educated, you're not afraid of it. You're not afraid. So we're going to endeavor to get educated, aren't we? And we'll let the Word of God do that. Matthew 7.15. Let's go to Matthew 7.15 now. What I got here is definitely going to be a two-parter. I knew when I wrote it, it was. So. Let's lay some groundwork here. Matthew 7.15. So in Matthew 7, 15, it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but in inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their what? By their fruit. Now, this is important. Hang on to that. You will know them by their fruit. The false prophets, the ones in sheep clothing, you'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, even good trees bear good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A, a good tree can't bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It's worthless, isn't it? It's, it's useless. Therefore, by their what? Fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. This is the master talking, right? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonderful works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You'll know them by their what? You'll know them by their fruit, not their gifts. Now, we got to distinguish this, okay? Let's lay some groundwork here. Just because somebody looks spiritual by doing what appears to be gifts of the Spirit doesn't mean they are. So just because somebody prophesies and they look really spiritual, doesn't mean they're of God. Are you hearing me? Now we're now we're gonna get we're gonna focus this down. We're gonna boil this down for you. You understand what I'm saying here? You're gonna know them by their fruit. What fruit do they bear? Don't just take the gift that you know what you know, uh, a prophecy or the things that they do, and say, 
wow, they must be a godly person. I'll receive anything, you know, that, that they dish out to me. No, you look at their fruit. Is their fruit loving? Is their fruit self-promoting? Trying to build a, a kingdom for themselves and trying to look spiritual so that people will be drawn to them? What's their fruit? Or is their fruit humility and their they're wanting to serve the kingdom of God and they're wanting to serve people and that they love people and they want the Spirit of God to minister through them. And it's not about me, it's about God. It, are they pointing to Jesus or are they pointing to themselves? You'll know them by their fruits, not by their gifts. Now this is important for us to hammer this down because there is a lot of false people out there that seem like, man, they're super spiritual. Look at all these gifts and things that are flying around here. Man, they, they must be godly. Not necessarily. Watch their fruit. Now, this is important because people get confused in this, and then this is what gives the gifts of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit a bad name in the church. So it's important. Jesus taught us. Our master taught us something here, right? Our master says you judge them by their fruit, he didn't say anything about judging them by their gifts. Amen. What was Jesus? You know, Jesus went around and did the gifts of the Spirit, but his fruit was, I love them. I love them, Father. I'll do anything. In fact, I'll even die for them. That's good fruit. You can trust that. You can trust that. Amen. Do you see the difference? All right. So, that, so we want to nail that down so that on the inside of you we'll know them by their fruits. Now, let's go to uh, Matthew 13 now. The master teaches us something a little bit more revealing. Matthew 13, 24. talks about the wheat and the tares. It's a parable that he taught, and it's so apropos even, I mean, today it's very apropos. It really does apply to us. Matthew 13, 24. So another par parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like. So he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, isn't he? And this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. A man who sowed good seed in whose field? His field. So he sowed good seed into his field. But while he slept, while he was away, while he wasn't, you know, while he was about his business, his enemies came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, there the tares also appeared. In the, in the kingdom here on this earth, the enemy comes and sows tares. Not wheat, tares. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he says, No, least while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares and bind them and in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So Jesus teaches this parable to a large crowd of people. And after he's done teaching, he teaches some other stuff. And then later on, he gets with his private staff, the ones that really are interested in the kingdom of God. You know, you'll have your big crowds that are like going, wow, that's awesome. Wasn't that amazing little uh, sermon or whatever? And then they just go home and they forget all about it. But there are, there's always this core group that wants to be disciples, that really want to know the truth of the kingdom. They hunger for it. And so this is that group. So if you drop down now to verse 36, in verse 36 it says, Then Jesus sent the multitudes away and went into the house. And the disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said to them, so now we're going to get his definition of what, that is, what that's saying. And he said to them, 
He who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world, and the good seeds are sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the wicked one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is at the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in fire, so it shall be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness. And I will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous, the wheat, if you will, will, will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Notice that there are people among us that are wolves in sheep clothing. They're not out for your best interest. They're out to destroy you. And they're in amongst the kingdom. So, and here's the thing. They look just like the faithful, the just, the ones that are for God. The evil one, those, those tares, they look just alike. To give you an explanation is that a tear and a wheat look very much alike when they first grow. When they're first coming up, I mean, they look pretty much the same. It's not until they come to full maturity, the wheat develops a nice, a nice golden head on it, and the, and the stem is, is nice and loose, and it blows in the wind and waves like this, and... It looks beautiful out there. But a tear, when it comes to full ripe and maturity, it start, the stem turns black. The head turns black, and it becomes very rigid. I want you to notice the wheat waves and bows in submission to the wind. But the tear is stiff. It will not bow to the wind. It is rebellious. It has nothing to do with the wind. It is a rebellious crop. But until it comes to full maturity, you can't hardly tell the difference. And the angels go, well, should we, should we gather them up and, you know, so that they don't, you know, so we can keep them away from the kingdom? And no, he said, no, leave them alone, leave them alone. I don't want, in the process of uprooting these wicked people, to injure my good people. So they are in among us, but there will come a day when God will separate the wheat from the tares. There will become a day when it will be abundantly obvious when the fullness of time comes, who is for God and who ain't for God. Who's pulling shenanigans and trying to act godly and trying to lead us astray and who have a heart for the people of God. It will become abundantly obvious. And I think those lines are being drawn today. We're going to see this. We're going to see those that are faithful to God and those that are not faithful to God. And it's going to become abundantly obvious who are the wheat and who are the tares, who are the sheep and who are the goats. Amen. But in the meantime, we need to be aware that there are those out there that look so much like the real thing that Jesus said in the end times that even the very elect would be deceived. We need to have our, our spiritual antennas up, don't we? See, we need to grow in maturity in the things of the Spirit of the God to the place to where we can discern between evil and good, right and wrong, so that we know we won't be tricked and, and deceived and slid, over, slid around and, and tossed around with every wind of doctrine by the slight and cunningness of men that will lead us astray. That's why it's important that you grow in God that you become more and more like the master, that you get in the word of God and know what it says. So when somebody comes up to you and tries to give you some doctrine, you go, no, that's not what the word says. The word says this. Amen. And when somebody comes up to you and they, and they act like they're all spiritual and, whoo, you know, lightning coming off their fingertips, you can discern, wait a minute here. My, the Holy Spirit's not bearing witness with you. There's something not right here. And you don't be led astray. And as we dig into the spiritual gifts and find out how they work and how they operate, then when somebody comes along with lying signs and wonders, as Jesus said, would be in the end times, 
that even the very elect would be deceived, we can identify those lying signs and wonders. So we're not led astray. Amen. And when we understand the spiritual gifts and how they operate and whatnot, we'll be able to go, wait a minute, I discern. You know, the Word says this about that gift, and that's not the way you're operating here. You're being a slick willy here. You're pulling a shenanigan. You'll be able to discern it. And the Holy Spirit will come in and go, you, you got that right. You got that right. In fact, here, in fact uh, it says here in chapter and verse, and you go, that's it. Yeah, thank you, Holy Spirit, for confirming that with me. Whew. And while everybody else is going, off with the guy, you're going, huh, huh, no, I, am, no, I ain't doing there, man. But if we're not trained and we're not taught how to hear the Spirit of God and what the Word says, we're going to be easily deceived and because the devil's cunning, man. He knows his business. So are we learning something here? Yes. We're, we're, how important is it that we pay attention about what we're going to be getting taught here? The Spirit of God wants us to be established in Him, in the kingdom, so we can properly represent the kingdom of God on the earth and not be just shifted away by some deceiver. Amen. We don't run away from spiritual gifts. We embrace spiritual gifts. And we don't get afraid of them, but if we're educated concerning them, then we won't be afraid. And we'll be confident in those gifts. So as one glorifying God and loving people, and the other is glorifying self and deceiving people. And we're going to be able to discern between the two. In Matthew 24, 24, Jesus made this warning. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. There is a scripture for you. Matthew 24, 24, that we were talking about. So false prophets have deceiving signs and wonders that will even deceive even the elect. They look the same. They look so much the same. But if you're operating in the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God will tell you the, the difference. And the Word will also identify deceivers and false works and find signs and, you know, false signs and wonders. And like I said, if we're educated, <laughs> we're not going to be carried away. We must discern by their fruit what manner of people they are. Are they self-glory or God-glory? Are they representing the kingdom and giving all the glory to God? Or are they drawing all men unto them in such a way that they're building up their kingdoms and their, their establishments and their... Ain't I something wonder? <sighs> no, all the <sighs> goes to Jesus. Amen. All right. We're already learning how to discern, aren't we? 1 Thessalonians 5.20, 1 Thessalonians 5.20, do not despise prophecy. What is that? What's he saying? What, well, prophecy is a spiritual gift. He's saying don't despise them, don't run from them, don't take them lightly. Take them seriously. Prophecy and spiritual gifts is something we need to take seriously, and we're going to be talking about that that we're to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Despise means to make utterly nothing of. The word not only depicts contempt or hatred, but it can also mean as little as to just ignore. It was translated set at naught three times in the New Testament. Paul's admonition is to not hate, dislike, or ignore prophecy. Abuses were prevalent in the early church as well, uh, as well were, and they were tempted to abandon it. There were a lot of abuses in the early church concerning spiritual gifts. And the, in fact, the very letter of 1 Corinthians is him setting them straight on those spiritual gifts. He didn't say, well, since you guys are abusing them and you have not a clue what you're doing, well, let's just not do that in church. You guys do other stuff. No, instead he says, no, 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 no. I commend you for de desiring spiritual gifts and wanting to operate in them. You're stumbling around in them because you got a little paganism mixed in. He says, let me set you straight so you can continue to pursue spiritual gifts. They're important. And there's a lot of churches that go, 
You know, it's just too much work to manage people who are, who are trying to operate in spiritual gifts and they're messing up or they're just being carnal or they're, or they're just on purpose acting a fool. And it's too much to manage it. Let's not go there. We'll just stay with the milk. Let's not, you know, let's not get into something. No. I, that pastor is a coward. Oof. Now, now, I tell you that because that's how it was told to me. I struggled with that. I sat there in third-year class, you know, and I'm going, man, I don't know if I could, you know. I mean, I came from Pentecostal church or whatever, you know. I mean, I know that, that I should be teaching on spiritual gifts and managing and that and all that kind of stuff, but man, I just don't know if I want to do that. I mean, it's a, and so I'm sitting there in Greg Moore's church, and he, and he, he it's like <laughs> he's talking about spiritual gifts, and he glances down at me, and it's like he knows he doesn't want to throw it at me, but, and he looks out because he knows I've got a church. And he says, those of you that are not teaching on spiritual gifts, you're a bunch of cowards. And I went, <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I'll take your correction. <laughs> so I got to work on it, man. I'll tell you what. <laughs> but we are. We need to be able to manage it. One of the things we're going to talk about in this is that as you practice spiritual gifts, as you get into spiritual gifts, I, I want to come to an agreement with you that you're free to operate in spiritual gifts here. Even if you mess up, even if you're uncertain, like, I'm not sure I know what I'm doing, go ahead and step out in it anyway. But be willing to receive me stepping behind, uh, up. Now, I won't embarrass you in front of the whole congregation, but come up beside you you know, later on, and say, brother, what did we teach about that? Oh, yeah, I got, oops. Receive the correction, because this is how you develop. You develop and develop and develop in spiritual gifts, leading and guiding and training in this. Amen. Be, so don't be offended. And now I say this, in the past, people have gotten offended and left. So there you go. Don't be afraid. This is a safe place to practice spiritual gifts. If you feel like God's leading you, then bring it on. We'll talk about it later. Are you hearing me? This is a, this is a training place. This is a safe place. So when you, when you build your confidence here and really learn how to operate in the gifts of the Spirit and learn all these things, then when you get out there, you'll be walking in a confidence in the Spirit of God where you'll be quite effective. Amen? This is, this is a training place. This is a place where we get to learn, and it's a safe place. Other places, they might burn you right on the spot and kick you out. But that won't happen here. Amen? Unless you're just plain rebellious. I've dealt with people who do want to take the correction, and they're just dog determined, I'm doing it my way. And I said, well, that ain't the Word's way. And he says, well, I don't care. And I said, well, then fine. We don't need your services then. You, and, and you can't, and you know what? You can't be afraid to do that, to protect the rest, because there's wolves among us. And if God shows me one, they're on their, they're on their keister. They're not repenting, they're out of here. Amen? Numbers don't matter to me. What I want is hearts that crave the things of God. That's what I'm after. That's what Jesus is after. I don't need 10,000 and compromise the message. Give me 50 that love God and want to get in there, and, you know? That's what I like. Mm. That's the good stuff. All right. So we'll just cover one more thing, and then, we'll, and, then, and then we'll continue next week. The purpose of the letter of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to get into 1 Corinthians chapter 12 next week. And we're going to pick it apart because he starts talking about spiritual gifts, what they are, how, you know, what kind of heart we need to have concerning that. But let's lay the groundwork here. 1 Corinthians 4.1. Paul says this. This is, the, this is the reason why he's writing this letter to the Corinthian church. And this is the reason why we're going to go through this instruction. 
okay? Listen to what he says. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. See, I mean, they're operating in the, in, in the things of, of the Spirit of God here. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift. What's his heart? He doesn't want that church to come short in any spiritual gift. It is healthy for our church to operate in every spiritual gift. I'm not saying one person is going to operate in all of the gifts. He disperses them, and we'll find this out. He disperses them as he wills, so that we are dependent on each other. There'll be some here that has a real gift for laying on of hands and healing. So when you need healing, you're not going to go to somebody else. You're going to go to that one. You know they got a gift. I need some prayer here, man. But a person who has a gift of prophecy, you don't want to go to them if you're sick. You want to go to... And so we all... You know what? All nine gifts are in this room. God intended for our church to be healthy and without any spiritual gifts. He wants us to have lack in no spiritual gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation or the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there is no division among you and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. What's he saying here? That as we operate in the gifts, he wants us to be on one mind. We all, he wants us to be all be on the same page. Instead of this group doing their own thing and this group over here doing their own thing, and that we are united as, one, as a one body functioning completely in the gifts that God has given us. And that's why he's writing this letter so there's unity in the body, so that we can function as a healthy, thriving, unified church. And so we're going to go through some of what Paul taught that church to have that. And in specifically, because he taught a lot of other things, we're going to focus zero in on what he taught to them about how to operate decently and in order concerning spiritual gifts in the church. Amen? You up for it? This is going to be good. This is exciting. Amen. All right. Well, next week we'll get together and we'll talk about the gifts, the seven lessons to learn concerning spiritual gifts. We'll talk about that next week, and it's pretty exciting. And we'll be, uh, you might want to read, if you want to go ahead, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. And we're going to be picking that apart. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. All right? Well, praise God. I didn't get to my sandwich. <laughs> I had an example in here I was going to use for a sandwich. We didn't get there. Anybody hungry? It's a chicken and cheese sandwich. It's totally legit. It's not a plastic. It's a real sandwich. That's all right. I'll bring a sandwich in next week. A different one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we don't want a green sandwich, Sam I am. <laughs> Yeah, ooh, ooh, ooh. run everybody out with the, with a rotting sandwich, you know. That's not a good example. The gifts are not rotting. All right, we'll praise God. Hallelujah. Well, I'll tell you what, is there, is there anybody here that's not born again? Anybody here does not know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? I know as I scan across here, I all these familiar faces and whatnot, but I never take it for granted. In fact, man, we just had a, had a little girl saved just a couple weeks ago. 